Okay. How's that? Can people see that front screen? Yep, I've got a yep. thumb. Yep. yep. Excellent. 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 So we'll uh, so we'll kick off. We'll kick off. I've got an echo. I don't know why. Has everyone got their mic off. Hello. That's it. It's gone now. That's fine. Um, yeah. First of all, uh, a big thank you to um, Linda and the uh, and the Uzeda gang for inviting uh, me to come along and talk to you all about sea trout and specifically try to make it a bit Sussexy. Um, uh, sea trout is something I'm very passionate about and um, I had a quick flick through the delegates list there and I see there's one or two other people, some old names that I know from the past that um, have probably got a heck of a lot more knowledge than me actually about Sussex sea trout so um, we could have an interesting discussion at the end. Um, I think they're very very special fish and um, and I hope after the talk that we'll all be enthused to go out there and do our bit to make sure that we make their lot a little bit better. So um, without further ado, I'll page down. So a few introductions first about my, my background um, and, and why I got involved in, in fisheries. Um, I think Sean, my, my boss, the director at the Water Trout Trust, calls people like me and uh, fish blokes. So, you know, I haven't got any fancy title, but I am a fish bloke. I've worked in fisheries and fisheries ecology for 40 years. Um, and when I'm not at work, I'm probably running around rivers with a fishing rod trying to catch fish. So uh, I'm an out, out and out fish bloke and pretty much a bit of a trout bum. So I'm really passionate about them. Uh, and the reason I am, it was all this little chat uh, in the photographs vault and that's the chap on the right. I look very different to how I looked in those days but this was my childhood hero Bernard Venables who was an author and wrote um, a cracking little storybook which was like a cartoon book called Mr Crabtree Goes Fishing and it really inspired me as a kid to spend all of my waking hours down near a pond or a stream um, chasing fish with a fishing rod. Um, and the wonderful thing about Bernard is he, he was a wonderful artist and he drew fish uh, in the environment that you'd expect to find them. So the chub were always much fatter than they would really be in real life and the trout were always chubby and spotty and, and they would always be living under an overhanging willow or next to a frond of waving ranunculus. And um, yeah, I owe an awful lot to him and I finally got to meet him uh, about oh it must have been about 25 years ago maybe more than that now so page on down so i've had a, a number of jobs I, I did work for in the in the water industry both for the water companies uh national rivers authority um and the environment agency for a long time i managed to escape before i completely lost my marbles um and i joined the wild trout trust um, about 12 years ago, I was a conservation officer. Um, we are not a fishing organisation. We are, we are a, a conservation charity, but most of our members are, are very, very keen on, on, on fishing. Uh, and indeed, uh, you know, so am I. But uh, our work isn't about making rivers easier or better for people to go fishing in. It's about the resources, it's about making rivers better for trout. And we do that through managing their habitat. We like to think that we're a source of information and support and um, I hope we'll, people will actually look us up, uh, have, check out our web, uh, website um, and there's an awful lot of information uh, on the website about trout, trout habitat management and sea trout. Uh, we've got about two and a half thousand members, we're a membership charity uh, we've got 12 staff. We don't have offices. We're, we've got one flat structure. We're dotted all over the country, all home based. Got a network of volunteers, a bit like you guys. And over the years, we've de delivered literally hundreds of advisory visits, project proposals and practical visits where we pitch up and actually work with local community groups, landowners, fishing clubs to try and make habitat better for, for trout. 
our core work, as I say, is, is getting people to understand what it is about a river that, that's important for, for trout. Um, so that's walking sections of a river and identifying what the issues might be. Uh, and I'm sure this won't surprise people in this in our meeting here today that sometimes that's that's not always what you go out and do. Um, very often it's about what you stop doing as well in terms of um, uh, uh, inappropriate um, management work. So um, we, we'll, we'll go out and we'll, we'll walk the river and people get a, a written report and sometimes those reports turn into full full blown project proposals and projects. We are, as a conservation charity, working on rivers and streams unashamedly trout centric and that's not very trendy in the modern era because everyone should think in terms of ecology. We, we get that completely, absolutely we get that. But uh, when asked, we always say, well, you know, is there is there a better indicator species to hang your hat on than, than a trout because of uh, its requirements for clear water, a healthy amount of water resource and an incredibly varied habitat. Um, one type of, of, of river section, a pool, is just not enough for a trout. They need a, a, a diverse range of habitats. And, and our argument has always been, well, if you get it right for trout, well, then um, you're, you, you won't be far off. Uh, that's just a screenshot of our website. Please check it out, www.wildtrout.org. Lots of little videos, how-to videos, uh, case studies. Um, we're very lucky one of our conservation officers is actually um, a professor at Lancaster University, and he turns quite complex science into language that people like me can understand. Um, and... Uh, I think we try and keep up to date with everything that's going on. And we've also got um, a lot of information out there to support people who are actually on the ground doing things. So we do have uh, various habitat manuals, um, chalk stream, upland. Uh, we've got a wild trout survival guide. I'm just about to rewrite our chalk stream habitat manual. We've got a bit of funding. It's a bit, it's a little bit old now and we, we like to uh, update the way we do things. And we've even got a full length DVD, which sort of goes around the country. Uh, it's our president there, John Beer, who's a chap on the right, who's um, very, good, very good author. Um, and John spent some time with all of the conservation officers um, looking at issues. From in, this, in this particular case, we're um, on the River Meehan replacing a, a little bit of wobbly tin revetment, which is a revetment of choice by some of the old river keepers in Hampshire with something a little bit more soft and sustainable. Um, but you can check that out. Those are available from our office. So there's enough about me and the Wild Trout Trust, but of course we wouldn't be able to be effective if we didn't have local champions and people that wanted to work with us and invite us in. And I just wanted to highlight one particular individual who I'm sure lots of you over in the Uzada area will know. And that's my dear old friend, um, John Whiting there on the on the left of this photograph. And I first met John about 20 years ago when I was I think I was still trying to keep salmon from becoming extinct in the test initiative. I was working out of um, Hampshire when I first met John, when I was with the <coughs> Environment Agency. But um, we soon became very good friends and John's got a real passion for Sussex sea trout, particularly in his little bit of the uh, Woods Mill stream that drops into the Ada. And um, I just wish we had more people like John in, in, all, in all of our catchments because we would do so much more for trout and sea trout conservation. So the nub of the talk then, um, about sea trout. Now you think, well, hold on a minute, that ain't no sea trout, that's a brownie. And you'd be right, it's a resident trout. It's one that um, I think it came out the western, west, top of the western rather. But I think the message here really is that um, we increasingly try not to be too hung up when it comes to management on whether or not the fish is resident or migratory. 
because ultimately it's one species. They, they interact. Um, it's just that they just have these most incredibly diverse life strategies depending on where you look. So um, they're trout and whether they are sea trout or brown trout is neither there, here nor there in many ways in terms of their freshwater phase. Um, but of course there are subtle subtle differences in terms of what, what you might put your emphasis on in terms of making sure that the river works for them. Um, and I'm going to try and explore a little bit more about why the Sussex rivers are particularly important for, for sea trout. Um, but please don't forget that they're all trout and we treat them all the same. That is a Sussex sea trout and that's a little photograph I stole off the Environment Agency as an, as an aider fish. But um, it's quite interesting to think or imagine that sort of roughly 14,000 years ago post Ice Age there was, we think there was probably about five strains, different sort of genetic strains of sea trout swilling around in, in, the, in the North Atlantic and um, all of our resident trout populations in all of our rivers were were kick-started by these chaps forging their way into uh, rivers um, to, to spawn uh, and then for some reason the, the life strategies changed whether that was because some of those fish got stuck and they couldn't go back to sea and they became residents whether it was just um, a complete accident which often happens uh, in evolutionary terms, in terms of how fish survive to find a niche, but basically that uh, that seems to be why we have rivers that have both resident browns and migratory sea trout. Um, I have to say I don't know what's so different about Sussex and that little bit of the southeast, whether those rivers remain free of ice for longer than the rest of the country, I, I, I don't know. But they, there's something very, very special about the, these fish and they are quite different in the way that they behave and their life strategies. And even, even differences from fish that run rivers like the Arran and the Ada and the Ooze compared to, say, the Test and the Itchin, which are obviously chalk rivers. But um, uh, they even look different. They, they're different. They've got a different phenotype. Um, and certainly they, they behave differently. And the, the Sussex sea trout are famed for being of this, you know, big average size as adult fish. Um, they, they are breathtakingly gorgeous fish. Um, and I think they're very special. So I always pop up a big a shot of loads of huge trout because when you've got any fish, you're wonderful sea trout. But I think the, the point of this slide is just to demonstrate that when you go and look at trout in other parts of the country or indeed other parts of the northern hemisphere, that the diversity is incredible. And I think the, um, the scientists will tell you that the, the trout is one of the most genetically diverse species um, known. They're much studied. Uh, and I think the term they, they use for them is that they are plastic. Uh, that they have this ability to be able to adapt and adapt quite quickly. Um, the cynics might say <laughs> when they think about people like me that spend half my life trying to protect and improve their lot, that why waste your time? They do it perfectly well on their own. They don't need the support. of um, They are great survivors and there's no doubt about it because of their life strategies. They are. They are incredible. Um, but of course we all know that uh, the way that we um, have modified rivers and we use rivers, uh, the way that we've modified water quality and water resources, that um, we're not exactly giving them the best chance that they always deserve uh, and that's, that's where we all come in. Um, so here we are, um, uh, what we call a little alevin. So this is a little um, a, a trout in the first, probably the first day or so of its its life, 
hatches out with a pile of stones on its head and slithers through the gravel with its egg, egg yolk attached. At that stage, you know, is it a brown trout or is it a migratory sea trout? Well, it doesn't actually know, and I would argue that at any stage in its in its in its in its first few months, it it might decide to be either. Um, very often, the, the the reasons why a fish might stay or might go are, are are often dictated by its local environment, but also um, by its by its genetics as well in terms of its uh, it, 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 its provenance in terms of, of of where its parents have come from, but they are very much environmentally driven, uh, and that and that's often. Um, that's often a factor associated with the river environment and often not just the water but the land the water flows through and I'll, I'll, I'll develop that a little bit more. So a little bit about the life cycle here and it's, it's probably not a brilliant slide but you can see some little eggs in the gravel at the bottom right hand corner and here we think in terms of the way we manage tr trout is that they, they're having sort of four distinct phases in their life cycle as, as sort of um, eggs or spawning, if you like, as one phase, right through to fry and then par. And then at the top, of course, you see these, these spotty fish. Well, those par have decided that uh, their life strategy is best um, best served by them staying in the river and they will remain in the river as brown trout they'll grow up to uh, an adult size of anywhere between half a pound and on some of our southern rivers they'll, they'll be as big as the sea trout depending on how rich the river is um, but on many of our rivers particularly it has to be said um, the spate rivers uh, which in, aren't in as inherently rich as the chalk streams, what happens is that, that at the par stage, those fish think they get a, a genetic advantage by migrating back to sea and coming back as great big fish because big fish carry more eggs than small fish. So you, uh, you give yourself a genetic advantage. Um, it's probably a bit of an arms race really because the advantage you get in coming back as a sort of a five or a six pound fish carrying thousands of eggs instead of five or six hundred eggs can be offset by the fact that you've got to travel hundreds of miles to do it in some cases and that you are very vulnerable to dying as a result of that. So it's it's interesting how these um, how these populations ebb and wane and on some rivers you'll get you know, it's it's that the population is made up of virtually entirely sea trout, whereas others it's almost entirely browns, and you'll get a, a variation in between. Um, and it's truly fascinating trying to understand which and why. But um, in terms of 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 how we support trout, um, we we use a few very very simple models. Many of you will have seen this one and we bang on about it an awful lot and it, we call it the sort of like milking stool or tripod model. It's basically the fish in the middle, the trout is supported by three columns and those are you know, water quality. Trout need clean water. That's, that's why they, they, they are a fantastic indicator species. They will put up with quite dirty water at times. Um, uh, and they're quite lucky in some of our lowland southern rivers that they're winter spawners because some of our spring spawning fish, particularly fish like grayling, are really suffering uh, because our rivers probably aren't as clean as they should be in some areas. Uh, but, but trout have the advantage of at least spawning when the temperatures are cool, which gives them a little bit of an advantage. Um, but that said, they still need clean water, low ammonia, high oxygen, cool temperatures and they need water quantity um, and this causes a little bit of confusion with with some folks I have these conversations over on the chalk streams sometimes particularly um, and and people think it's about um, water level it's not it's about flow flow drives habitat quality uh, and if you have rivers where 
the flow is unreliable uh, or the water's abstracted. And, and when you think in terms of the Ada, I've seen the Ada in high summer sometimes when there hasn't been rain for a long time. And you think, wow, this must be a, you know, a marginal environment for trout at some start sometimes because um, the amount of flow uh, can be incredibly, incredibly low, but, but flow they need. And lastly, it's habitat structure, what we call structure and connectivity. What are the habitats? What sort of habitat do we need to sustain all life stages? And this is really where groups like Uzeda Rivers Trust and Wild Trout Trust can work hard to really make a difference. Because this is about um, in ensuring and identifying where the problems are, putting them right and uh, joining up those habitats and uh, make, making these, these, these rivers better. One of the, the other tools we use is the, what we, the simple bottleneck um, tool. The, the bottle or the jar even if you like on the top left hand side there where there are no limiting factors impacting trout means that we've got fantastic spawning, thousands of fry, hundreds and hundreds of par and each pair of adults that spawn will make at least three adults into that life cycle. So the population is constantly buoyant or expanding. Um, but as soon as you have a habitat bottleneck, um, and on the right hand side, it might be um, for those adult fish, it may, well, it may well be that they can't access spawning habitat, or there's no deeper pool habitat for them to hold in, then you limit no matter how good your spawning and par habitat is, you, you, you limit the productivity of the fishery. Um, likewise with juvenile habitat, um, and that's the one that I think gets missed most by, by land managers and, and fishery managers, making sure that um, there's somewhere for small trout once they've finished spawning. A lot of people understand you know trout need good clean gravel for spawning they put a lot of effort into putting spawning habitats together and forget how important it is to link that with with good quality nursery habitat so that's the habitat uh, bottleneck model so in in understanding habitat for, for trout um, we have to recognize that you know, the, the habitat they need will vary and it varies according to their life stage. Are they adults? Are they fry? Are they par? Um, it varies according to the time of year. They will occupy different parts of the river at certain at certain times of the season, uh, even in terms of <laughs> whether it's day or night. And we know that they migrate to different parts of the river um, under different light conditions and temperature and flow, etc. And, and for a river to be full of fish, it requires lots of accessible, available habitat for all life stages. And that means a complex and varied environment to provide and promote, you know, a diverse and resilient ecology. And this photograph demonstrates how this is often created in a, in a river. This is the Kentish Stour. Um, and that's a little photograph I took oh, a long time ago of a, of a tree that had dropped down and normally here, the angling clubs and the landowners whip the trees out as soon as they fall in. They'd left that in for one winter. And in that one winter, it had created this lovely shoal of, of uh, gravel here, another shoal in the, in the, in the middle of the channel, and um, a deeper run down the far side. So rather than the whole of this river being flat bottomed and like a billiard table, which it probably was before, it's suddenly like a humpy, bumpy egg box. And then that brings all sorts of opportunities for, for trout. Um, it's, it's a bit of a catchphrase of ours, but you know, trout live in trees and woody material in rivers, over rivers is, is incredibly important. And, the, and this is why, because it, it just helps to sort and man, manipulate bed material. Um, and this was a classic, another a classic example for me. I, I was doing a walkover with a river keeper on a river. This was actually in Hampshire. And he actually apologised to me that he hadn't removed that tree. And he said, that's the only piece of land we don't own. And he didn't seem to just grasp the fact 
but it was the only bit of river too that had any nice clean gravel that wasn't full of soft sediment um, and of course it's been promoted by the un undershot scour and you've got a lovely place for a fish for a fish to hold underneath the tree and that hole where the gravel was has been blown up and shot up into this lovely up ramp uh, and these up ramps particularly tails of pools or at that and at the head of riffles these are the places that fish actively seek out to spawn trout will seek out to spawn and that doesn't matter if it's in a, in a larger river or up a tiny little tributary or a, a headwater stream it's the up ramp and the reason for that is because the water is flowing through the gravel rather than skirting over it and those eggs can be laid down in the gravel and they can be really safe uh, and get lots of oxygen so um, lovely untidy rivers with lots of woody material particularly in the spawning and nursery streams absolutely critical so if you if your if your stream sings for trout i'd argue this with anyone i think there's a fair chance you you, you because you're creating this diverse and varied ha habitat there's a good chance that all of the other creatures that that we all want this this diverse ecology will also will also do well uh, and don't let anyone else tell you different. That's all I would say. Um, I don't know if we've got Paul with us tonight. Paul Sharp took us some of the most amazing photographs he took on the Ada. I'm sure people in Ouse Ada Rivers Trust have seen these. But every time I get these photos out, I'm blown away by them. Um, and this is a, a photograph of a, a, a Sussex Ouse um, sea trout on spawning migration. Um, and what I want to talk about is, is, is when do they move and, and how far do they go and what are the triggers for migration? Um, well, it won't surprise anyone to know that, you know, a, a, a fish that needs to swim upstream needs water, flowing water to do so. So the spawning migrations uh, are, are triggered by flow and they're triggered by flow uh, in the autumn uh, with the trout being a winter spawner. Exactly when that happens can vary enormously and, and fish can hold off for quite a long time and, and you might get you might get pods of fish coming in on various spates any time from um, late September, early October, right the way through till 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 January if they've had to hold off. Um, but they move on the back of that 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 flush of water, um, which helps them to be able to um, negotiate many of the inappropriate structures that we've stuffed into our rivers over the last thousand years or so. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about structures and, and the fish's ability to be able to get through them. Um, the one thing I have learned over the years with sea trout is that you will read lots of information in fish pass manuals, lots of scientific papers about exactly what are the determinants with regard to whether a fish can get over a structure or not bearing in mind what the head loss is, how, how high the structure is, what the flow velocities are, etc, etc. Um, I've learned to say never say never completely when it comes to sea trout because they just, um, it's almost like you blink, they develop wings and they're the other side of a structure. How they do it sometimes, I don't know. I think, I think obviously in big spates, an awful lot of them come out of the river and go around structures. There's no doubt about that. But um, that's not a justification for, for walking away from sorting out some of these impoundments and, and, and making sure that, that fish have a better chance of getting up and through. Uh, this is a, a shot I used a lot, it's taken by a chap called Damon. Some of you know Damon from uh, the Environment Agency. Um, and this 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 was a is a pretty typical site really. This was on the Ada at Wynham, and I think you guys in Ort, under Pete King's supervision, have um, sorted this structure out now by modifying the adjacent weir, taking boards out of the weir, removing the main structure so that fish can actually get up the main channel now. Whereas before they used to come up this side stream and try and shoot up this culvert now. I know this isn't the only culvert that looks like this in Sussex. There are dozens and dozens of them and they're all pretty typical. You get a long tube, often, often, you know, what, why they couldn't put an oversized culvert in and sunk it, sunk it below bed level 
built it, God knows, but they often have this erosion apron, which makes, which makes it even harder for fish to migrate through. Um, and in this particular case, I think Damon told me, he saw this fish on several occasions sort of get over the, over the brick apron into the culvert and then it would disappear and then Damon would hold his breath and think, has it made it, has it not made it? And then like a millisecond later, it would just get squirted out as it loses energy before it gets to the other side of the culvert. Um, breaks your heart really, it does me anyway. And, uh, and these are the sort of structures that we really need to get to grips with. And I know you guys are and have been and uh, more power to your elbow, that's what I say. And I come across all manner of, you know, who on earth thought that was a, a decent structure to build? But, you know, pipes on top of pipes and then you build a nice little sort of brick, brick, brick wall around it. It's, um, I've even seen them like that where you just put a load of pile of pipes down and then tip tarmac over the top. Um, we see these time and time again and they're, they're problematical. And they're not just problematical for trout, obviously. We've got this issue with with making sure that rivers can actually discharge sediment because, hey folks, rivers move a lot of mud as well as water. And I know you guys have also sorted this one out and um, uh, I use this slide a lot because, you know, there are weirs and then there are weirs like this. Uh, this is this was on the River Uck. It's no longer there now. I don't know whether the bottom apron is still there. I've not been back to see this. I took this photograph a long time ago and I know Pete King and, and the gang there sweated hard over sorting this one out, which I think was constructed just to feed water into some little ornamental ponds. Um, but it impounded the river for, God knows, a mile and a half, maybe two miles. Uh, yeah, and I know I said never say never, but my God, how a fish negotiates a structure like that, God only knows. I, I would say it couldn't. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, another phase of the life cycle now, and that's and that's one that we really talk that much about. We fixate on fish migration, and we always think migration is one way, but of course it's a two-way trip if you've got to go to sea to grow big. And for, for trout that smultify and go to sea, I don't think we give enough thought as to whether or not structures can pass smolts easily, uh, and they are slightly odd in the way they behave. Sometimes they just don't like going through culverts and tubes. Um, I have to, have to say the one thing I am really worried about, and I know it might come up in a bit of a conversation at the end, is um, the brave new world of beaver, which we're going to see uh, in rivers. Well, I think they're where, where you are now, aren't they? But um, I'm a little bit dismayed to see even the latest science that's been looking at the impacts of beaver on trout populations have not really satisfied me with regard to how do smolts escape through really well sealed beaver dams. And the problem is if they get delayed, they shoal up, they get plundered um, and you would get massive losses of smolts behind structures that they can't get through so i've heard all sorts of things about um pipes and things but that's that's not how smolts migrate they don't they they don't go looking for pipes at the base of a dam um so i think that's one area if we're going to have a, a little bit more of a discussion with our our, fr our friends who are very pro beaver and i can see i'm not closing my mind to the fact that beavers could be incredibly useful for trout but um I just think this is one area where, where, where we need to give it a little bit more thought as to how we're going to get these chaps safely out to sea uh, when they need to go. So let's let's talk um, a little bit about the sort of tributaries because I showed you the slide of the the, the sea trout forging up the main stem of the the ooze. Um, Sea trout will spawn in main stems of rivers, uh, and they, but their strategy is to is to try and utilise any habitat that then that their 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 friends and neighbours can't. So their strategy is to push up as far as they possibly can, and they will utilise any any side stream or headwater that they can get access to 
provided there's gravel there um, because um, that's what they're looking for and you probably know from walking a lot of your Sussex streams that you know some streams are incredibly rich in, in, in gravel and various types of gravel and some are not and some you only get the odd little outcrop of ironstone or sandstone uh, or flint every every few miles it might be a 15 meter wide seam and you'll get one little riffle and that sustains the entire entire stream um, so Gravel availability and quality is, is really important and um, when I'm ever, whenever I'm looking at the small streams, side streams and tributaries, I'm constantly looking in the toe of the bank to see where there might be seams of gravel because those are the places where you want to be really relaxed about um, lateral movement. You might want to encourage it with flow deflectors so that you, you actually make the river move, move sideways and blast the gravel out the toe of the bank. Uh, and free up new habitat for trout. Um, a little bit about spawning. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever seen trout spawning. It's the greatest thing in the world. It's the best thing to do after you've had your Christmas lunch is to, is to, is to get out and see trout spawning. Um, I've got a little bit of video here that Peter Chase has, um, has shared with us. We've, and if Peter's in, in the audience tonight, I think, is that right? I believe he is. Um, so I'm going to attempt to close this down and just I'm sure you've probably all seen Peter's video. I'm sure he's he's probably sent it to you guys as well. But I think if there's anyone in the group that hasn't seen the way a, tr a trout uses its tail um, to, to beat out the red, the nest, then Peter's um, is, it's only a little short clip is really useful. So um, bear with me. I'm just going to close the um the presentation down and open up a little video clip. I didn't embed it in my um, PowerPoint presentation because I've had too many nightmares trying to do that. So uh, just bear with me a second. So I just close this down a sec. Let's have a little look. Um, this is on a little trip of the Ada, and um, I, what I want you to look out for is the little brown trout. That's, there's a little resident, there he is, little resident, resident cockfish just nipping in. That's so typical because, of course, the small brown trout interact and spawn with the sea trout. Now, there's, there's the henfish there. Um, Peter's camera is unfortunately focused more on the reeds than the trout, but you can make her out there and there she goes. And she's using her tail to beat the gravel and then look at the sediment, the plume of sediment that she's dislodging from the gravel. Um, I've spent many, many hours on many rivers gravel cleaning and I sometimes think, well, actually, trout have got a pretty, pretty decent set of kit to actually get rid of sediment for the gravel and they do that by flopping over onto their sides, beating the gravel, and they, they create this depression. Um, uh, and, then, and then the henfish squirts her eggs into that depression, moves upstream and does it again. No surprise to any ladies watching that it's the, it's the henfish that does all the work while the cockfish sits back smoking a cigarette, waiting for it all to happen, and then uh, just nips in and, and uh, pleasures himself, so to speak. Um, and then it's all over. But um, it's a it's a great it's a great thing to watch. And some of these sea trout, and I know, knowing some of you guys in the Ada and Ouse catchment, you know, you go out on, in these little headwater streams and you see these huge great fish that are probably in some cases too long to be able to turn around in the section of stream that they're actually spawning in. Um, and it's funny, I, I quite often go out and people say, we've got, we've got salmon in our stream. And I say, oh, yeah, they're every bit as big as those itching and test uh, salmon but you know they are they are indeed sea trout so thank you for sending me that Pete, Pete and uh, I'll just try and get back to the PowerPoint now if I can and off we go seamless um, Another little, another little shot there showing out. Uh, this is a, an, an, another one of Damon's. Damon always gets the best photographs, and this is typical on in in the Sussex streams. If you've got an area there, I'm 
pretty sure that might be imported gravels that the fish are utilising there. It looks a little bit too light for naturally occurring gravels. But this is this is classic what you get, the, uh, the depression, um, uh, the fish squirts her eggs into the depression, she moves upstream and, and, and bats the gravel again and the eggs are laid down in this mound. Um, it's interesting that um, the, 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 sea, the sea trout tend to gravitate towards more laminar flow than really boily flow and I think that's because the eggs tend to get sucked down in the red. The gravels are spawn on well in an ideal world they'll be in the sort of four to sixty millimeter range i think sea trout we utilize cobbles up to a hundred mils in size maybe bigger um, if you read the books they'll tell you ideally you know 10 to 20 mil i personally think that coarse gravel is really good for sea trout um, and that's been borne out for me by a lot of observations um, now that's that's a local gravel it's mainly sort of i think it's chert and a bit of flint but it's got a biofilm on it which is why it looks quite black and it's come out the river and this is these are chips of ironstone um which you do find on a lot of the uh, the rivers in sussex and kent um uh, particularly in in the weald and uh, fish will spawn on this and the nice thing about um the gravels in these Weald and streams where the water is derived from green sand springs rather than the chalk is that the gravel is really loose and the fish can beat it and they can beat a good red into it. Um, here's another little shot of a, a, a Sussex stream. You notice there's not much gravel on the toe of the left hand bank, but it's obviously a big seam of gravel here. This isn't a spawning site, far too turbulent. But um, those gravels under big flows will be sorted and they might end up on the tail of this run here and there might be spawning opportunities here. Um, and, and, and this again, this is roughly what, you know, what you'd be looking for. And this is quite a, quite a uh, benign, calm red. This is more on a, a chalky stream rather than on a, a green sandy stream. And the one thing I would say with some of the streams that, that belt off the South Downs, and there's some that run into the Ada and the Ooze, there's the Plumpton Mill Stream um, and the, uh, the Woods Mill Stream into the Ada. Uh, and there's a plethora of them that go down into the, uh, into the Arran system. Uh, they're really interesting, the little chalky streams. And although they, they're quite gravel rich, um, I think they do they do suffer problems with compaction. I'll talk a little bit about that um, later. So more examples of, of reds. Um, the timing is is the, the, the timing of spawning is linked to a combination of sort of photo period, water temperatures and local adaptation. So um, Obviously, with with the the eggs are actually hatching, that that's that's absolutely also the case, um, and it's very much linked to degree days. So trout trout eggs will be in the gravel for anywhere from um, sixty days to ninety days, depending on how cold it is. Um, uh, if 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 the water if the water is is roughly seven or eight degrees centigrade then it it, it it might that those eggs might hatch within 60 days but we all think fish start to sort of hatch round about february time uh, through into into march but it, it, it will depend on temperature um i'm gonna ask linda to raise her hand because i can see her on my screen do you guys do red red monitoring surveys you already do that OK, so I've, I've, I don't know if it's even worth me going into it in any de in any detail. Oh, you want me to go into it in a bit? OK, we can talk a little bit about about uh, strategies for red, red monitoring. But um, but it's a really good, good way that, that volunteers can sort of tr try and get a handle on on whether or not they're having success with their projects. Um, it's not always an indicator of um, trout productivity. Um, because obviously how productive a red is will vary from one season to another under different flow conditions. Um, so just because you've got a lot more reds in one year than the next doesn't always mean you get more trout. But if, you, if all things considered, it's a really good indicator of trout activity. And uh, I would say it's a brilliant, brilliant way of getting, 
getting volunteers involved in uh, in in looking at rivers, seeing what's going on, uh, and you know manipulating habitat and seeing what sort of response you get. I would say, you know, reds are relatively easy to spot after they've been freshly dug, but again, it depends on the type of stream. Um, and and on, the chalk, on the chalk streams, they're an absolute doddle. They stick out like anything. Uh, they can become increasingly harder to spot over time. This is, this, is on, this is more typical of your sort of streams. Um, and um, this is what... what one um, muted at the moment. Am I the only one who's getting that noise? No, yeah, everyone's okay. All right, it's okay. It's just um, it sounded like someone was marching across the gravel with hobnail boots. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this is typical. Um, this is this is the, the sort of little stream that you get um, uh, in, in Sussex. Uh, a little gill if you like deeply incised clay banks and then every now and then you'll get a little outcrop of gravel and if you're lucky when you look at that gravel and you see that light mound there like that you can bet your life that uh, that's been created with the tail of a of, of a trout not applicable to you guys uh, to be perfectly honest but um, the size of the reds you think well sea trout or salmon this is what this is this is one of the dilemmas we have over in hampshire Sometimes it isn't a dilemma, and I just thought I'd show you that for a bit of fun, really. Um, that appeared overnight, um, and it looks like a dump truck of gravel has been put into this, this little carrier of itchin. Um, I would have loved to have seen a tail of the salmon that created that red, but um, or it could have been more than one salmon. So a little bit about, about reds again. Um, one of the things you need to look out for or, or maybe comment on when you when you do your red surveys is where you think they might be and how productive you think they might be. I love this slide because a, you can really see the red very, very easily. Um, it's exactly where it should be at the tail of some um, area where it's going from a deeper pool down to a shallower riffle further, further downstream. But what I like about this slide is, is this habitat in the margin and the way the river tapers from uh, up to virtually nothing with all of this brushwood in the margin. Because for me, when those, um, when those trout pop out of the gravel and they go sideways, as they do, and I've seen them do it, and I've electric fished them do, um, um, when they've been in there, they go into these areas. And, and when you're only half an inch long or an inch long you want to be anywhere where a fish of three inches feels uncomfortable so if it's a really shallow gradient to nothing and well covered and right next to a red i think those areas are are incredibly productive and all i would say is um how many reds do we need? It's, on some streams, you will find overcutting of reds. You, do you know what people know what overcutting means? It's when it's when often a lot of trout come up to a bottleneck um, a structure. They can't get above it. They utilise the nearest spawn habitat downstream, but they all tend to sort of spawn over the same gravel and they dig it up and dig it up. And of course, you lose you lose productivity. What you really want in an ideal world is those is those fish spreading out. Um, but I would say on some of these, these little, little streams, if, if, you, if you only have um, two or three reds per kilometre of channel, that might be more than enough. Um, because what happens is even one productive red will produce an awful lot of fry. Um, and it may well be, as we saw from our, our bottleneck model, that. If you've, if, if you've only got limited amounts of juvenile habitat and well-covered juvenile habitat, there's, there's just going to be a density dependent mortality and they will just die. So you, you might think, oh my God, we've only got one red. Um, but that red might be all you need. Uh, and the same stream you'll go back to and every year you'll think, well, we've done all this work, but we're still only getting one, one or two reds. Um, don't lose, lose too much sleep over that. Um, 
but do lose sleep if you don't get any reds, particularly on streams that historically, uh, you know, you used to get them. So let's talk a little bit about the, um, the, ju the juvenile habitat or somewhere for the kids to hang out, of, as I've called it here, because, as I say, I think I think it's something that we don't think en enough of. And the type of streams and the shape of streams that we get right across southern region obviously vary enormously. This isn't in your, your patch and you'll probably recognise that it isn't. Um, but you do have chalky streams um, and when you have chalky streams if you get sunlight you get plants um, and the plants can provide incredibly valuable habitat for juvenile trout in shallow riffly water it's not a great slide and you might not be able to make it out but within riffle there's bits of starwort and, um, and water crowfoot ranunculus and of course the margins are lined with this crest and the trout get right in, the juvenile trout, right in there when they're tiny. Um, obviously in the winter months, a lot of this is gone. The first frosts, the crest grows, the stream gets wider, the levels get shallower. And then that's when your chunks of woody material become more important in terms of provided habitat uh, and cover for juvenile trout. Margins that are a tangle of brushwood are, I think, are are wonderful really important um so please 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 if you if you've got if you've got people who've got streams and they've got properties that that go down to streams encourage them to keep the toe of the bank rough and ready don't string it up and, and pull it out um, because of these are areas particularly particularly as i say if it glides up to very shallow water um a great places for small for small fish and of course that, that's tough for predators um, and, 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 and great for the fish themselves. Um, this is more typical, this is a little Wealden stream. This actually is one that flows out of Ashdown Forest. I can't remember, I think this is a little tributary of the Medway, but it could easily be on the, on the Sussex Ooze or, the, or, or a little trip of the Ada. But I call them cover logs, great big trees that have fallen down that are stable. They're not going anywhere. They're not causing anyone any problems. Um, and if they're, if they're cranked round, they're not going to cause a full width debris dam. So the landowners aren't going to get too worried about them. But that little area underneath the log. Wow. You know, those are, those are fantastic little hidey holes. That tiny little trout. And these work equally well over pool habitat for adult trout because they mimic an undercut bank so if you've got trees that you can hinge over lop over fold into the margins like this well they're gold dust and uh, the more of those you have um, the better you're better off you're going to be and this is a little example of of, of why this is a uh, i don't know what it is if it's a, a little tangly thorn that's just he uh, hinged over or fallen over but you can see what it does to the stream. It, it does sediment sorting. So it collects, it collects the fines in the margin. It brushes the sediment from the middle. Um, and these are all really important processes in terms of creating and maintaining habitat, habitat for trout. Um, again, if you've got chalk derived streams, again, like Woods Mill Stream or Plumpton Mill Stream, I would argue that um, you, you need you need some, some open areas. If, if you've got too much tree shading, um, you might want to think about doing what we call skylighting, opening up some areas. Because if you do punch pockets of light in, you will get you will get some weed growth, and then you'll get some productivity. Um, I think this helps with helps with invertebrates, uh, and the weed, of course, is cover for for juvenile fish. Um, Slight caveat there on some of these streams, if they if if the flow is unreliable and it really drops off in the summer, um, you know, obviously shade help you know, does help to keep the channel cool. But of course, if you've got if you've got emergent plants, if you've got beds of, of stuff like starwort and ranunculus, um, water crowfoot, you know, that that provides shade as well. It does it does locally help help moderate the amount of um, UV that 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 gets into the water. Um, so dappled light and shade for, for the spatey streams, you know, we, we generally recommend they should be at least 60, 70% shade. 
for the chalky streams probably 50 50 or even 60 40 in favor of a bit more light as as a real rule, a rule of thumb and these little streams that we find but coming off the uh, off the downs again these little steep little chalky streams with these lovely little microclimates in them full of hearts tongues ferns this particular one is is um, I don't know what the stream's called. The area's called Botany Bay. It actually drops down into the Western Rother. So it's on the Aran system, this one. Um, and I've, I've seen several of these along there where you've got gravel everywhere, but the gravel's pretty bloody useless for spawning because it's all glued up. It seems the nearer you get to where the, the water bubbles out of the chalk, um, the more uh, calcium carbonate deposit you get. So you get this, this two, if you've heard that, that's, it's, it's basically it's just like um, a very, very skillful tiler has gone in there and uh, put grout between all of the stones. And um, the poor old trout needs more than a tail to break a, break a hole in it. Um, so these are the sort of streams where maybe if you wanted to give trout a ha helping hand, uh, these are the sort of areas where a little bit of breaking up the crust with a with a fencing spike and a rake probably might help to boost a bit of spawning success. Just gonna take a little slurp. So I was talking to to you earlier on when we were talking about. It's fair to say that that even though that you've you've got you have got some uh, little chalky streams that percolate into the ooze and into the Ada, most of the streams you, you would classify as being fairly low productivity. And, that, and that's why that's why those fish decide to go to sea, that they're not going to be able to grow to a big enough size as residents to to get their fair share of eggs out into the environment. So I think that's why you've got this incredible sea trout uh, run in, in the in these rivers. Um, and that's really typical of, of what your stream would look like. Actually, this is quite interesting. I took this stream, uh, this photograph. I was out with um, Sam um, looking at a stream. But this one, unfortunately, the back door is closed to sea trout because this runs through um, four or five online ponds. Um, obviously, a lot of the Sussex streams have been, um, they were historically dammed for hammer ponds. Uh, some of them have still got ornamental ponds on uh, with monk sluices on manner of dams that make it impossible for sea trout to utilise habitat. You can bet your bottom dollar that a little stream like this, if there was no dam between here and the sea in the in the winter, this would have a sea trout red on it. So monitoring performance, obviously the Environment Agency uh, because they've had their resources cut, they're doing less uh, uh, less fish monitoring. I have to say, I did decades of, uh, of electric fishing surveys, and I loved it. Why wouldn't I? It's great fun. Um, but when, when you really analyse it, you think, well, um, it's also pretty expensive, labour intensive, and um, electric fishing doesn't come without any impact at all. I'm sorry, I don't care who what, what anybody tells you, and there's a little, a lot of information put out there about that it causes no harm or problems whatsoever. Um, I would beg to differ on that. It, it is invasive and intrusive, uh, whereas red counting isn't um, provided. You know, you don't you don't stamp on top of reds when you're looking for them. So. I think working out where your trout reds are um, and how many you've got and the sort of habitat um, around them is really would be really time well, well spent and collecting that data and sticking it into an annual red counting report um, and these days you know with a, with taking a little gps reading uh, and a photograph and you can stick it all on one report and i would argue the more you more years you do that for um, the more valuable that data set becomes um, I'm going to bore you a little bit by just 
talking through and, and I did this for a little group in Hampshire the, a couple of evenings ago so I thought I thought I would try it out with you as well it, it whether it, it it matches with what you're already doing with your your red surveys I don't know it may well be that you're you're already doing above and going above and beyond this in terms of the data you're collecting but I thought I'd just run through this in terms of a, a methodology for red counting um, and uh, generally speaking, there's there's little point in going too early. Now, um, I, if you ask me, I wouldn't be able to tell you when a tip when a typical uh, Sussex ooze sea trout spawns because <laughs> I think I've seen them at it uh, um, in in late November and in February. So uh, whether that it vary, it probably does vary from from trib, trib to trib. So the volunteers need to get some local knowledge about when when their fish arrive and when they're likely to be digging. But I think an initial walk over around mid-December, mid especially if you've had heavy rainfall, after heavy rainfall, and then a sudden drop in temperature, which might be a cue for spawning, um, is a good time to start looking. Um, if you go too early um, and, you, and you, you, you keep on having to go back, um, and it depends how many volunteers you've got, I suppose, but I think you, you, you should be able to cover a sort of like a kilometre of channel in, in a day uh, without too much of a problem. Choose a day when the conditions are suitable. I know it sounds bloody obvious, but um, make sure you can see the bed of the stream. Um, I've always, if you can, walk, walk from downstream to upstream and if, if it's if it's possible to do so only because you might actually see more in terms of you might spot fish sitting on the reds um, I know on the chalky streams if you walk the other way um, they see you miles before you see them and I'm thinking in terms of little streams like the Costas Brook which which drops into the into the out into the western rother it's it's absolutely like gin and uh, those fish see you if you're walking the in the other direction um, and it's such a delight to spot them so walk from downstream to upstream polarized glasses if you, glasses is, if you've got them to cut out the glare record the locations as accurately as possible if you have got a gps um, app on your phone a little little grid reference digital image um, and, and and a few notes um, yeah, as I say, initial, an, an, initial, an initial survey is, is great as a benchmark. If you've, if you've never been to a stream before, go and do it. But it will, the value will increase over time. And of course, when you're out there doing that, you can make notes. You can imagine you're a half inch trout popping out the gravel and thinking, where am I going to go? Am I going to drop down into a big pool and be eaten by resident brown trout? Or have I got a nice bit of well covered juvenile habitat? <coughs> in the reach immediately below or is there something I could do could I lay brushwood in the margins and make it even better um, I'd record I'd record the flow conditions when you when you see your reds um, the, the way I'm, I'm not sure this will be applicable to you over here because of course I'm not quite sure about the network of flow gauging weirs you've got there will be a flow gauging weir on all of these systems uh, you can access them online. I've got a little um, link I can share with you. And I think it, it's, it's worth just on the day that you do your red counting, put a little reference to what the, f what the, the flow data was for that particular, that particular day on your survey. Again, take opportunities to identify any, anything that you feel is an obstruction. Obviously, if you if the obstructions there and you see a nice lot of reds upstream of it, you can you can go to bed and not worry too much about the obstruction. It's 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 not so much of an issue. Identify any overcutting. And also, obviously, underused spawning habitat. If you walk a little stream and it looks absolutely wonderful to you and you, you get some knowledge of other streams and you can see, well, I don't understand it. It's, it seems to have all the right attributes, but I'm not seeing reds. Well, maybe that's one to really have a concentrate on and a thorough walk over in the lower reaches just to see what's going on. You know, are there any massive debris dams that no one's looked at for 10 years? Um, 
I don't worry about naturally occurring debris dams unless I see the bed of the river substantially rising. But I have seen debris dams where the bed of the upstream above the debris dam is, is two metres higher than the bed downstream. That can be problematic if you've got a really V-shaped v steep, steep channel and the river doesn't spill out in any spate because that will be problematic for migration. I think sometimes that's the time to do a little bit of intervention. This is why I worry a little bit about our beavery friends when they get going, because um, people are not going to like it if we go in and disturb beaver dams. But um, yeah, that's a debate. Um, there we go. And what was the last one? Yeah. Check to see if there's any historical databases out there. Who else has been doing it? Um, yeah, I think you can read all that. M makes a major contribution. If you can, if you can arrange your volunteers, divide up the catchment so that uh, you've got an enthusiastic volunteer and don't overload people. I know if you actually look at how much channel you've got in each one of your catchments. There's a heck of a lot of it. So you're probably going to need plenty of volunteers. Um, and you're going to obviously need landowners that are prepared to allow you to tramp over their land. Uh, and there we have it. Well, I've got I've got some and I can share it with you later via email, some sort of typical uh, red counting sort of uh, survey reports. Um, but I think I've probably bored you to death enough now and we can have a little bit of a chat so i'm going to hand back controls to uh, to linda and then we can have a little q a session in, unless everyone's fallen asleep or starving hungry so that's it okay right that was brilliant thank you andy some really great information um are you able to stop sharing screen or do i have to stop i you? am ah there you're stopping right there we go and then i get to see everybody again hello everybody <laughs> right so that was full of information i don't know about everybody else but my brain's about to explode it was brilliant thank you so much okay. we we do do a sea trout watch and we've uh, got quite a few of our volunteers here tonight um and they i know that some people have been out uh having a little wander around seeing what they can find um but i also know that covid has caused a few restrictions oh. from that yeah. funnily enough it seems to be the way um but uh yeah we we send our information to clive fetter oh uh, right yes of course yes yeah. he's he he says hello and sorry he can't make it tonight but he's mm. moving house so yes. he's all up in the air and uh doesn't yeah. know what what end of the day or week it is so uh, he's I, a bit no, i know clive has and and uh, they've has done some great work in, in collecting information on Sussex Sea Trout. There's people there with a lot of local knowledge, and I saw we've got Dave. Dave Brown is in lurking. Yeah, well. yeah. I he's almost been... didn't allow him, but I, I did at the I last know, minute. I know. <laughs> he, he'll know more. He'll know more than I've forgotten about uh, Sussex Sea Trout. So. Oh, in that case, he'll be doing the next talk. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Come on. I'll log into that one. <laughs> He's staying on mute. He's, he doesn't want to be dragged into this by the look of it. <laughs> um, anything to add, Dave? No, no. <laughs> yeah. So um, does anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute. Um, um, maybe I don't know quite how we should do this. If you just raise a hand or something, if you've got a question um, and uh, or just shout at me one or the other. Either works generally um no questions any debates should we open up the debate about bad uh, beavers <laughs> yeah i thought i thought that might be a bit I'm, I'm i'm there's bound to be some beaver fans sitting here and uh, and, and, I, and i may be a beaver fan i've i've got I've, I've got a very open mind on it at the moment um i just when i heard about that beaver that has escaped from Nip, yep. I, I did feel a bit sorry for it because i thought there aren't many trees to gnaw up in that part of uh, uh, of the Ada, the bit I've seen anyway. Um, not by the river anyway. 
No, no, there certainly isn't. I live in Upper Beading and there are not many trees along the river around yeah. here. And along some of the ditches and things around the place, there are, but whether you'd make it into those areas, I just don't know. But uh, last seen around the cement works, apparently. Is that so right? my, my sources tell me. Oh, probably building a house. <laughs> Maybe, yeah. Taking over the cement works. I wouldn't blame him. <laughs> so Mate, you had your arm raised. Do you have a question? Linda, I have one question. Um, hi, Andy. Um, Sorry, who am I talking to? Peter Chase. Hello, Peter. Hi. Um, just one question for you. Um, how much do you think temperature affects the sea track and what sort of temperature do you think it needs to drop down to? The streams around here seem to be stuck at about 7.58 degrees, although one day last the week they went down to about 5 well, for winter for winter spawning, you mean? Correct. Yeah, um, that's a uh, that's a good question, and of course, it, 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 there's no doubt that temperature temperature is a cue for them spawning. So sometimes they'll be in a system for quite a long time, and you'll you'll have a system of sort of westerlies going through for a week or two, and then suddenly high pressure builds, and you'll get two or three nights of frost, and wham, they're off. So there's no doubt whether it's ultimately what the temperature is or the temperature gradient that makes them go i i really don't know um this is a bit of a pro you know the, the fish themselves obviously um they do vary from system to system you will find some references in there um cer certainly i i've known them to to really get going when the when the the temperature gets down to sort of four or five degrees but there are some streams I know where they spawn every year and the temperature never drops below sort of seven to seven or eight degrees because there's so much groundwater flowing through them so um yeah they as I said at the beginning of the talk I think that they are so adaptable and so resilient um and and very often they will find a way and for me that's the one thing that gives me some hope with regard to sea trout and climate change. Um, I have to say, I think, I think, I think grayling are probably doomed in some of our southern rivers. But I, uh, I'm, pre I'm pretty sure there's going to be a lot of other species struggle before we lose we lose trout and sea trout because they've just got this most, uh, you know, amazing life cycle. And um, and you take you take the Plumpton Mill Stream as a, as an example there. I think um, um, I think Plumpton College would would have to try and pollute Plumpton Mill Stream every year for about ten years before they really put a dent in that population. But uh, because the, the, there's always a few out at sea waiting to come back in and and repopulate it, and that's an amazingly uh, resilient life strategy. Um, but I'm waffling, and Peter, you can probably guess, I can't really give you a specific answer to your question. But I think it's more about temperature gradients as the trigger. And, and certainly, you know, where, where, the, where the sea trout, whether it's the atmospheric pressure they detect, they high pressure, or, you know, that, that's a good time for spawning. It, 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 it's going to be stable conditions. I'm not, there's not going to be a big spate, so I'll go, I'll spawn. I really don't know. It would seem like natural selection pressures would probably think that's that's highly likely um you, they're more likely to um to, to spawn successfully get their red covered get it secured uh and hopefully you know you know maybe with withstand some washout well yeah. thanks for andy just on the pressure i remember you mentioned they look for a high pressure point possibly because that won't bring rain but uh i've recorded some previously where the they've actually gone the other way where the pressure's been 10 18 and 24 hours before it's dropped down to it was 10 well uh, so they dropped <laughs> they'd look for dropping pressure yeah is is that is that in the, the dropping pressure is that is that fish arriving or fish cutting fish cutting okay that's really interesting yeah um rachel you had your hand raised and then we'll come to annie and just after that, if that's okay. So Rach, go for it. This might be a slightly silly question, but is there some sort of um, thing about how far fry will disperse? Be looking to enhance to enhancements. They yeah. Well, I th I think there is science. There is, 
Yeah, there, there's there's masses of science about trout fry dispersal, um, uh, and a lot of that is linked with um, with density and and habitat quality. Um, but again, it's the the, the logic suggests that the clo the closer they are to the habitat they require from the red, um, the the less loss you get. But 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 ultimately, this the the whole strategy with trout is that the, the with the adults pushing up as far as they can, that red as far up that system as possible, so that when the when the fry pop out, they drizzle down, laterally initially and down, so they're occupying those really shallow margins, and that's why I think it's always wise to think in terms of two types of juvenile habitat. You know, when you're an inch long, you're not going to be out in the middle of the channel because you're going to get eaten. Um, but of course, if you're in the margins and there's lots of you, and as you get bigger, because they're territorial at all stages of their life cycle. So they're constantly looking for space as they grow. So I, I think what happens is almost like, uh, the way I try and imagine it, is that they're, tr they're just trundling down as they get bigger, looking for more space. And the biggest one stays and the smallest ones get jostled out and then they, then they have to look for their space. Um, but but ultimately, I think what happens is if there's limited habitat, a percentage of the, those fish end up push, getting pushed out the tributary and then they, um, you know, some might make it, some might end up as, as, as food. The thing I don't understand with regards to the ewes and the ada is, is the fact that... Um, we don't really know much about juvenile habitat or where those fish go, as far as I understand it. Um, and I, I remember having a conversation with Dave years ago about, you know, um, do some of those fish act, act, actually as juveniles utilise tidal habitats, which to my knowledge um, hasn't, hasn't been found anywhere else. But you can't actually find, you know, where those juveniles are on some of those systems, which which is really surprising. Because um, obviously, you know, the, the sort of information I'm, I'm, I'm giving you this evening is based on a consensus of all of the other streams and rivers that, that we get involved with and look at. There's no doubt those Sussex fish, they've got their own unique way of doing things. Um, and I'm sure there's an awful lot about Sussex sea trout that happens and, and is probably really crucial and important that's completely unknown to me how that you know in terms of how they how they complete their life cycles yeah. um, uh, it, more probably it's one of those species and one of those areas where there must be some great research to be had um, but the trouble is there's no there's probably no funding drivers this is it trout a trout if they were atlantic salmon they'd be they'd be bloody phd students crawling all over sussex trying to get funding and doing projects or cute and cuddly yeah. <laughs> can i just quickly um uh, add a, a yes, quick um, um follow on to andy's comment about yeah the, we still really don't know where the fry actually and, and the young part you go and that's something which has been um recognized for over 100 years i mean i'm the custodian of the um, Angling Society's records, the Ozanga Preservation Society records, we actually got records from 1904 when someone from the Natural History Museum actually came down to the North End stream, they called the Cooksbridge stream, to try and get samples of the fish then. It is, they recognised then that um, lots of fish went actually went up it, but uh, it never produced any smolts. I've got a letter from the Ministry in 1946 saying the users long, long puzzle me because those has a substantial sea trout run, uh, there aren't any smolts. So it's something which is, it's a, 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 a recurrent theme, which um, 100 years on, we, actually, we, we never actually cracked. But I mean, going back to Andy's point, yeah, if you, you look at so, so the North End stream um, in um, a couple of months' time, uh, you'll see lots and lots and lots of uh, newly hatched swim up fry. Um, a month later, um, they've all gone. The only place they've actually gone is either um, uh, they've all been eaten or they've actually dropped in, into the estuary. Uh, the tidal river and that's, that's probably the most likely explanation it and it does happen. happen elsewhere i mean um to, uh, um some parts of the um, west coast of scotland you, you, you can find uh, young sea uh, on the rock pools uh, along with the uh, blennies and gobies under the bladder rack 
Yeah. So, so it, it, it is a, a, um, a, a, an own life cycle. And yeah, we don't have the proof. And it will be an absolutely fascinating subject to actually research. But I think there's quite strong circumstantial evidence that um, uh, um, a lot of, lot of our road is actually sustained by fish, which actually do go to sea, or at least the Tide River, at a, um, a, a very early stage in their life history. And, That's great. And, and, if, and if they do, and, I, and I'm sure I've got absolutely no reason to think that you're that what you're saying is spot on, Dave, because you know they're not they're not immaculate conceptions. You know they're <laughs> they're obviously you know they are producing juveniles there. Um, I find it amazing that they're dropping in the, because I, I look at rivers like the Ooze, the Tidal Ooze, Tidal Ada, Tidal Aran. They're not the most friendly environment if you're a fish of an inch and a half, couple of inches long. Yeah, they must be whistling up and down with the yeah. tide. They can't yeah. be holding station. Um, there's nowhere to hold, is there? Yeah. So are they just, they're like, it's almost like they're pelagic. They're going up, but they're going up and down. <laughs> Maybe I guess yeah we we really just um uh, um um don't, don't, know. don't know yet. It's fascinating to, to, to contemplate what might be happening, but yeah, we, as of now, we, we really just don't actually know. I, I there's, a, there's a I project right there, isn't there? Well, there is. But <laughs> I, we, I shall we move on to another question? Um, yeah. We've got a couple of questions lining up, and you had your hand raised at one point. Did you have? A yeah, question? no, my question was very similar to Rachel, so it's oh, right. really that's easy. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and um kevin has asked about packing of the gravel is it that the spawn needs to breathe and and the reds must be in gravel free sediment uh free of sediment and is the problem with chalk that it is packed in the gravel making it difficult for spawn yeah the eggs yeah i think it's 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 where you get this um the, the, the chalky water the water that bubbles out of the straight off the chalk it's funny it's it's not all chalk streams are have this um high high uh, tufa component but it's it's the calcium carbonate deposit and it glues the gravel together so yeah. it and you can feel it you put your hand in and it's just absolutely like like concrete and um and of course the the fish have a wonderful tool you can see the way the hen fish rolls on its side and it bats the bed with its tail but it's not going to make any progress in uh, in in if the if the gravels are glued together which is um possibly possibly why although we always think the chalk the chalk stream the water quality looks wonderful there's lots of gravel there shouldn't they be incredibly productive streams for spawning and very often um the sea trout select the water that flows off the the clays and the gravels, probably the slightly more acidy sections. Um, we see that a lot on the River Meehan, for instance, and it's it's it must be a selection process, because the Meehan in Hampshire, is a very steep chalk stream. The top end is very very chalky, uh, all ch pure chalk stream, and then it runs over a, 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 a about four or five miles of alluvial clays and gravels with little streams that flow in either side. Um, and the sea trout just don't really penetrate onto the chalk. They're spawning in right at the bottom end of the river on those on those those little um, more spatey streams. And some of the most productive streams are, you know, are, are quite in along the south are quite acid. The, the new forest streams are incredibly productive uh, for sea trout. Um, that's so, great. Yeah, it's, it's gravel. It's, li it's linked to, to calcium and um, and and compaction for sure. Anybody else got any other questions? Oh, one more for you. <laughs> <laughs> Big controversial, maybe. Uh oh. <laughs> now, Andy, you you mentioned about beavers. And what they might do, what <coughs> how they might help. On the Ada, we've got a specific problem with a seal. So, how much do you think the seal, which is resident in the Ada quite a bit upstream, say about five miles, five miles up from the coast, up near Linda? <laughs> um, seen them a couple of times. Seen livening on the bank, etc. And he's a resident there. How much is that going to devour the sea trout on their way up? 
Well, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Mr. Seal would love to get his, uh, get his gnashes around the odd C trait. And, uh, but I, I think if you've got one seat, one seal on the, uh, on, on the Ada, I probably wouldn't lose too much sleep over that. You've got, you want to see the bank of seals that you have, um, uh, in the estuaries of some of the rivers, uh, up the east coast of the country they're there in their hundreds um and the sea trout population still uh, still manages to make it but uh uh i'm not, i'm not a person that that tends to get you know too excited or too worried about about the odd the, the odd, odd predator and uh i guess i guess we're just not used to seeing seals i'm sure they've they there, there was a time when there was probably plenty of seals along the south south coast and their numbers i know in some areas are rising um but but they're not eating lettuce sandwiches peter let's put it that way <laughs> <laughs> okay one, one more perhaps we must have got you there um how do you think uh, these um marine protective areas are going to help the sea trade well, i think they could be awesome. i think they could be fantastic uh, personally um obviously Again, you know, we, we, we certainly don't know how far um, Sussex sea trout um, travel for their for their for their feeding. There's something about so there's something about wherever they do go, they seem to be able to seek out the top restaurants because they come back looking an awful lot chubbier than most of the sea trout that run run the Hampshire chalk rivers, and that's all about sea feeding. Um, so whether that's that whether that's to do with the chalk plateau that runs out into the English Channel um, and rich feeding in those zones, I haven't got the foggiest idea. But uh, the, um, you can only assume that if people are not running beam trawls and uh, scallop trawlers over over fishing grounds, and you're going to get complex habitat full of um, full of crustaceans and food for for, for fish that sea trout aren't going to sort of benefit from that. They're bound to. Um, They're going to be bound to benefit from the fact there aren't fish, fishing in those areas. Um, I think, uh, Steve, have you got your hand up? Yes, just a quick one. Um, Andy, you said that um, you think the sea trout or trout make a choice on their life strategy depending on sort of environment and, well, and what, what... Whether it, I'm, I'm not sure it's a conscious choice but <laughs> is, is it scientifically proved that they are exactly the same species the genome is yeah. exactly the same yeah for in, for instance and the fish farmers will tell you you can have bearing in mind brown trout have been in domestication in this country for you know a, a hundred years you can get you can get a batch of um i don't know how eaten or loch leven strain domesticated silly old stocked brown trout um and as juveniles you'll put them in a in a swedish tank if you actually starve them that the, the response is they 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 smultify so they they still have within their within within their genetic makeup the um that well I'm going to starve if I stay, so I'm going to my great ability, um, which is incredible, really, because you think that, that because they haven't required that for so many generations, they would have lost the ability to smolt. But they they will they will smolt as a response to being starved. So, um, yeah, and we, we, we do know. And, and even, when, even when you see you those spawning interactions, the little video of uh, Peter's um you can bet your life that little brown trout wasn't there just to take family photographs it was going to nip <laughs> in and have, have a little go as well so uh, they interact yeah brilliant any more questions all done i think so thanks so thank much thank you everyone for inviting me and bearing with me um and uh, listening to me rabbit on about sea trout and, and very best of luck to all of you over in Ooze and Ada. We are here still and Pete knows where we are if, if ever you want to hook up and do anything together. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. Yes. Keep on, keep on doing it. <laughs> we certainly will. Yes. Um, yes, the, 
the trout watch and uh, sea trout watch is, is a big part of what we get up to. And I, I've just seen that um, Ginny Muddle is on here as well, who looks after the Plumpton Mill stream. And uh, uh, they've got some great records and things as well. So we've got some really great volunteers that really do help us out with doing that work. So it's... Uh, Fabulous. Yeah. Yeah. Very Brilliant. Thank you so much for uh, coming along and, and giving us this book. It's been really great. It's, um, yeah, wow. What little creatures they are. <laughs> yeah, they are. They're, they are amazing. I know. I know we worry about them, but uh, they are amazing and they're, they're special. So you'll have to forgive us, some of us old boys, if we appear to be slightly besotted by them. But uh, okay. <laughs> I think you're one. forgiven as long yeah. as everything else gets taken in as well. Okay. Thanks very much, Andy. Yeah, bye bye. 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 Um, right, so everybody, thank you so much for coming along tonight. Um, I hope you enjoyed it and that uh, it was informative. I th certainly thought it was anyway. Um, I have made a recording of this, so I can send it all out to you if you want it. Um, and um, so you can watch it again at your leisure if you so wish. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming. I don't quite know how you end these things now. Do you just go, bye bye? There's no cups of tea and coffee. It's such a shame. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye bye. 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 Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. Uh... Thanks for organising. Bye. No worries. Thank you so much. Right. Thank you. Bye.